evening. My name is Susie Lishman and I am a consultant histopathologist here at Peterborough City Hospital. This evening we are filming a living autopsy and this means that we're not going to be having any dead bodies but we will be uh, explaining what an autopsy involves with the use of a live model. I'm doing this for the Royal College of Pathologists, it forms part of their public engagement programme and they're going to use it both to inform the public about what an autopsy involves and also to help other pathologists develop similar events of their own. We've done a series of videos, this one, and then a, some smaller short ones for pathologists to tell them how they might want to theme or tailor their event, how to promote it, and some top 10 tips on how to organise and deliver such an event. But this one's going to be relatively simple. What I'm going to be talking to you about this evening is how we do an autopsy and how we look for the cause of death. Now, I always say this, there will be no blood. And normally I get a few groans, oh. <laughs> there will be no body parts. There will be no dead bodies. But despite all of that, <laughs> some people still feel a little unwell. Uh, hopefully you won't, hopefully you're used to blood and guts, but um, I do find that sometimes people feel a little sick or a little faint. If that's you, please don't be embarrassed, but do, uh, step outside uh, earlier rather than later. Please don't wait until you <laughs> keel over and, and hit your head. We have got assistants on both sides who will be there to look after you. They'll go and get you some fresh air, get you a glass of water and sit you down and make sure you're okay. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, I've never fainted in my life. Well, it's often those people who are the ones uh, that feel a little unwell. I've had six foot six rugby players keel over. Um, and I've had people wait outside and apologise to me and say, I didn't think I would be that person, but I just thought I was going to faint. So please, if you do feel unwell, please just step outside. Now, just another couple of things before I start. I don't normally dress like this when I'm doing a post-mortem. <laughs> um, so normally I would wear scrubs, blue, uh, you know, theatre blues, some big white wellies, uh, an apron over the top, and increasingly now we wear a, a face visor so it goes around the forehead and it's got plastic to stop any splashes and then I'd wear a pair of gloves and probably some gauntlets just to make sure that I don't get anything on my on my arms so we cover ourselves up uh, to, to, to make sure we don't catch anything um, from the bodies that we're examining. The other thing to say is that I don't do this alone so I would never do a post-mortem on my own and we work very closely with very skilled, trained colleagues called anatomical pathology technologists, APTs for short, not surprisingly. And they are trained to um, open the body and they're the people that you will meet if you go down to the mortuary um, to, to view a body. Um, and we work very closely with them and we couldn't possibly do a post-mortem without them. However, this evening, I'm going to try and do it on my own. And the final thing to say, and you may already have noticed that I'll use the words autopsy and post-mortem interchangeably. And that's because they mean exactly the same thing. So autopsy comes from the Greek, meaning to see for oneself. It means to open up the body and look inside and see the cause of death for yourself. Post-mortem is from the Latin and it just means after death. So it's an examination that's done after death to find out why somebody died. So they mean exactly the same thing and we tend to use them interchangeably. OK, so let's begin. Now, you might think the first thing I'm going to do is pick up a scalpel, but absolutely not. Before I go anywhere near the body, I need to look at the paperwork. You all know what it's like with paperwork. Um, so I want to know why somebody's asked me to do a post-mortem. Now, the vast majority of post-mortems in the UK are done for the coroner. The coroner is somebody with a legal qualification and it is their responsibility to find out who died, uh, how they died and when and where they died. But really the bit that we're interested in is how, how they died. Um, so there are around 500,000 deaths every year in England and Wales and about 45% of those are referred to the coroner. And they're normally referred because there is no doctor who can fill in a death certificate, so they don't know the cause of death. But there are also several other times when, even if the cause of death is known, you must refer to the coroner. So if the person's in custody, if they're detained under the Mental Health Act, if they're under 18, if they were in an industrial accident, or if it's thought that their occupation may have contributed to their cause of death, if they were in an accident, no matter how long ago, so if somebody 
was in an accident 25 years ago, but that actually had a direct impact on the cause of their death later, then that still needs to go to the coroner. If drugs were involved, whether prescribed or recreational. So all of these special types of death have to be referred to the coroner. Now the coroner uh, requests a post-mortem in just over half of the deaths that are referred to him. So about 120,000 coroner's post-mortems are done in England and Wales every year. And they're done by pathologists like me, general histopathologists who work in hospitals like this. And we actually spend the vast majority of our time, over 90%, working for the benefit of the living. So we look at the cervical smears that come in, the biopsies, the tissue that's removed in theatre or in the clinic. And that's what we do most of the time, making diagnoses like cancer and infections and things like that. But a small proportion of our time, I spend maybe two or three hours a week we will be doing post-mortems as well. And this is completely different from a forensic post-mortem, and that's the sort you see on television, the glamorous sort. Um, so we, we don't go climbing through muddy rivers in the middle of the night or <laughs> running around with police officers <laughs> and all of that sort of thing. We, we work here in the hospital. So the forensic post-mortems, very few done in the UK because we have so few deaths, which is great news. Um, and they're very, very specialist. Again, you see the sort of thing on television where they will take samples from under the nails, they'll take hairs and fibres, they have to uh, build up all the evidence in case it's a criminal case, and that's very different from what we do. So the sorts of post-mortems that we would do in a district general hospital like this would be perhaps somebody found dead in bed, hadn't seen their doctor for a few months, and nobody knows really why they died. Or perhaps they were digging the garden. The important thing is that nobody's able to sign a death certificate because they haven't seen a doctor or the cause of death was unexpected. I'd also occasionally do post-mortems on people who have taken their own life, um, but if, if there's any hint that there was anybody else involved, that it might be murder or negligence or anything like that, then I would ask the forensic pathologist to step in and I wouldn't do it. So the first thing I want is my instructions from the coroner. Why are they asking me to do this post-mortem? And they send over a standard form um, and it will tell me a bit about the, the deceased and variable amounts of information. Um, as you'll know, anybody who's ever seen a request form for anything, um, sometimes it's a couple of words, sometimes you get a nice essay. So what we want to know is what are the circumstances around the death of this person? What happened? Were they digging the garden, clutched their chest and fell over? Were they running a marathon? Were they in bed? What sort of medication were they on? Had they had any previous surgery? You know, with the past medical history is very important. We often get that from the deceased general practitioner. And then really what I want to know is why does the coroner want this post-mortem? Um, you know, why had the, if the GP saw the person three days ago, why do they not feel that they can sign? Um, so all of those things are really important. So once I've read all of those, the next thing I need to do is have a look at the body. And again, I don't immediately pick up my scalpel. What I need to do is first make sure I've got the right body. So you know everybody in hospital will have a wristband, an ankle band, some form of identification that can't fall off easily. And so I would always have a look to make sure that they've got that identification and that it matches the information on the forms that I've got. If it hasn't, I would not proceed. I would make sure that I clarified that before I started. And I'd make sure so I'd have a, a name, a date of birth, for example. OK, so once I know I've got the right person, um, I will have a form that I will fill in as I go along and I'll do an external examination, a bit like the way that a doctor would examine somebody who was alive. You have a look for clues on the outside of the body. So I would describe the body, whether it was well nourished or not, because that can give you a clue about what else is going on. Um, I would have a look for scars. They're really helpful. If somebody's got a great big scar down the middle of the chest, it makes me think maybe they've had heart surgery or something like that. If they've got a scar down on the lower side of the abdomen, maybe I'm not going to find an appendix, so I won't spend too long looking for it because they may have had it taken out. So I'll have a look for scars. So I examine the whole body. I have a look at the fingertips, and this is very similar to the sort of thing a doctor would do when you go to see them um, in the clinic. I'm having a look for one of the things I look for is nicotine staining. Because smoking is a, um, contributes to quite a few different causes of death, particularly things like lung cancer, but also heart disease and other cancers. So if I know that somebody's a heavy smoker and has got very heavily stained 
uh, fingers, and that's starting to give me some clues. Now, I do the same sort of post-mortem on anybody, irrespective of the history I'm given or the clues that I've got. But what I would do would be to focus in on a particular area if I found something abnormal. But if I found immediately something wrong with the heart, I wouldn't stop and think, oh, well, I'm not going to bother looking at the lungs or the brain. We would always look at all of the organs because you never know what else you might find. And it's not unusual for people to have two, three or more things wrong with them. So we don't stop as soon as we find an abnormality. The other thing I would do is make sure I have a look at the back of the body. There are some apocryphal stories, I think they're invented to scare junior pathologists, um, about um, when you do your exams, when you're training to be a pathologist, you have to do a post-mortem and you do the best post-mortem you've ever done in your life. Um, and so there are stories of things like something being put on the back just to make sure that you've looked and if you haven't, you failed. I heard one of um, a professor who was meant to put a hair between two of the toes and if when he came back to see the body it was still there, you failed because he thought you hadn't looked thoroughly enough. Now I have to say in my 25 years as a pathologist, I've never found a cause of death between the toes. <laughs> But you never know. So <laughs> we always look at the back. Um, you don't want to find a stab wound or something happening. But particularly, we're looking for things. What we see more often is things like pressure sores um, and, uh, and things like that. OK, so we've had a look at the outside of the body. I would check the eyes. I'm looking for things like anemia. Um, I'd have a look at the mouth, the dentition. Is it well cared for? Are the teeth being looked after? Have the, has the person got their own teeth? Uh, and any other clues that I can pick up. So I would record all of those. Um, and even before I start, the APTs would have weighed and measured the body so I can work out the BMI. And that's helpful in my report because it gives an idea roughly of the build um, of the person. Now, I think it's time to get a scalpel. So I use a scalpel like this, fairly standard. This is a, a disposable one. But for what I hope are obvious reasons, this evening I'm going to use a pen. Um, people sometimes look at me slightly blankly when I say that, it's because he's not actually dead. Okay. Um, so I'm going to use this pen and show you where the incisions are that we make when we do a postmortem. Um, and so the first one starts up behind one ear, comes down the side of the neck, round the front of the collarbone to the centre. And I'll show you this again in a minute because I know it's not particularly easy to see. And then I do the same on the other side. So if I demonstrate on me, coming down the side of the neck, round onto the collarbone, and then into the middle, like that. And then we do one final incision, and it's straight down the middle, all the way down to the pelvis, like that. And this is called a Y incision because it's sort of Y-shaped. And this is the incision that's been found to be the best one for get, giving you access to the internal organs. But the other thing that's really important is it's quite easy to reconstruct the body afterwards and to sew it up. <coughs> because one thing we never forget when we're doing a post-mortem is that this is a person. This is somebody's loved one, someone's father, son, and that the relatives may want to see the person after they've had the post-mortem. Um, so we're very careful. And that's why we do these incisions just behind the midpoint of the neck rather than on the front. And we go wide and around the collarbone so that if the person's wearing a shirt or a shroud or a normal top, you won't be able to see any of the incisions at all. Um, so we, at every stage, we bear in mind that this is somebody's loved one and they may want to see them again afterwards. So once I have made my incision, I need to open up the skin. And it's a bit like opening a book. So I'll use my scalpel and I use some forceps, so like giant tweezers not um, very technical, um, but I've got a couple of different types and I'll just explain the two types to you. So I've got toothed forceps, many of you will be familiar with these, and non-toothed. These are a bit more like normal tweezers. They've got a bit of corrugated metal there, but um, if I grab hold of something and pull, they'll come off. They're not particularly good at gripping. Now when somebody's alive, that's good because you don't want to be pulling things that you shouldn't when you're doing an operation, for example. Um, but when somebody's dead, that's less important because you're not going to try to sew them back up again and put everything back afterwards. So I often use toothed forceps and they have got just a little spike on one side and it sticks into the other. And when you put that and pull, it's not going anywhere. So it 
gives you a much firmer grip and it's particularly useful when you're trying to open up the skin because the skin's quite tough and so you can hold the skin and then I just cut gently behind it. Now again, I'm very careful here not to cut into the skin again itself. So I want it open like a single leaf of a book. We call it buttonholing. If you make a little hole, it looks like a little buttonhole in the skin and you don't want to do that because you want to try to preserve the person as much as you possibly can. So that's a very careful job. And this is normally done by APTs. They're the experts at doing this. And so you would cut all the way along, just very carefully, peeling the skin back until it was open on both sides. And then you do the same again around here. And then you can peel this up and it will then expose the organs and the tissues and the muscles of the neck. OK, once you've done that, you're faced with the rib cage. So that's there to protect the heart and the lungs, um, but it means it's quite hard to get at them. So we need to remove the rib cage before we can proceed. And for that, we have this special instrument here. A lot of the instruments we use for the post-mortem are not particularly specialised, but this one is. These are called rib shears, and they've been developed, and you can see it's like a giant pair of scissors, and you've got a little curve on the lower part, and that's so that I can put it below a rib, and it's got a nice long handle, and those of you who know your physics will know that that means that even a weakling like me can put enough force into cutting like that. And so we hook this under each individual rib and cut up the side. And then we do the same on the other side. Now in a young, fit man, the ribs are quite bony, they're very calcified, and it can be quite hard going. In an elderly lady who has very thin osteoporotic bones, I can probably cut the rib cage with a pair of scissors. That's how thin the bones can get, and you can just cut up the side. Um, so once I have done that, I'll use my all-purpose knife. Uh, this is called a PM40 because it's used for post-mortems. I'm not sure what the 40 means. I'm going to keep it in its sheath so I don't cut myself or anybody else. Um, and I would use this just to cut the muscles and anything else that is holding the rib cage in place. And then once I've done that, I can remove it completely. And we call this the rib shield because it's sort of shield shape. And I put that to one side. And then that exposes the heart and the lungs. Now, the first thing I do before I remove any of the organs is have a look for any fluids. And that might be blood, if somebody's been bleeding, for example. If somebody has an aortic aneurysm that's burst, you might open up the chest and find that it's full of blood. Or similarly, if something's happened in the abdomen, you might have blood or other fluid. And to remove and measure those, we have these. Now, they don't look particularly specialised. <laughs> they look a lot like ladles, and that's because they are. Um, but they, these are these very, very posh label, ladles. Um, and the thing that they do is they tell me how much one scoop contains. So the small one is 120 mils, and the big one is 10 ounces, whatever that is. <laughs> it's quite old. Um, so it's probably about 250 mils or something. It's bigger anyway. Um, so what that tells me is if I remove the blood, and if I did 10 of those, then I would know that I had... Um, 1.2 litres of blood, so I don't have to actually measure it again. Um, so I'd remove any fluid. I'd normally keep it in a drug in case I need it later on. Um, and so that's what those ladles are for. The next thing I do is to remove the bowel. Now, actually, the bowel in a dead person doesn't smell much worse. In fact, sometimes it smells better than the bowel in a live person, because <laughs> at least it's cooling off. Um, for those of you who've been in operating theatre when somebody's had a perforated bowel with peritonitis or an abscess, it doesn't smell great, particularly because it's warm. Uh, so um, people are sometimes a bit squeamish about the bowel, but actually it doesn't, it doesn't smell that bad. Um, but still, we probably want it out of the way. There's a lot of it, um, and once I remove that, it means I can look at all of the other organs. In our exam, to be pathologists, we always open the bowel and we display it very neatly on a table um, so we can show it to our examiner. In real life, it goes in a bucket under the table uh, <laughs> and um, I tend to only open it if there's something that suggests to me that there's an abnormality in the bowel. So if somebody had a bowel tumour or if they died because they'd lost a lot of blood from the bowel, then obviously I would open it to try and find that. But actually most causes of death are not related to the bowel. The bowel tends to cause chronic problems rather than something acute. 
that kills you. So I take the bowel out and I do that. The one thing I haven't got here is a piece of string because what we tend to do is at the top of the bowel, just where the small bowel leaves the stomach, we would tie a knot with some string. And then I hold it up, I'd cut, cut on this side of the knot and hold it up. And then it's often likened to playing the violin. I'd cut the fat that holds the bowel and, and take it out um, like that. Now, sometimes when I do this event, I will have images of organs behind me because I'm trying to keep it simple. Today, I've gone for cardboard cutouts. So here is a small intestine. So this is the first part of the bowel. Uh, in fact, if we start right at the top, esophagus. We'll come to this in a minute when we look at the chest. But so your food goes down the esophagus, into the stomach, sits here, obviously, at the top of the abdomen. And then this is the next bit, um, the small bowel. It's about six metres or 20 feet long all coiled up in the middle um, and it's fairly rare to get tumours of the small bowel actually most of them are in the large intestine so we would remove that um, and put that out of the way and that then leaves the large intestine this is a slightly small large intestine but um, so that starts at the bottom right hand side of your abdomen so that's where the appendix is so here's the appendix here on this part then it goes up and across and down and then round a little corner and out so that's what your large intestine looks like. That's about 1.5 metres long. So this is really a mini version or five feet. Um, so it's short, much shorter than the small intestine. And part of this is stuck to the back of your abdominal cavity. Um, so I would need to use my knife to remove it. And so I would cut behind it and then take it all out in one bit. And then the whole large and small intestine would go into a bucket. So I could either open it if I wanted to. Now, if I wanted to open it, I have another special instrument, which is these. These are bowel scissors. It's also called an enterotome, which is posh for bowel scissors. Um, and it's like a pair of scissors, and then the bottom lip is a bit longer than the top one, and it's got a little spike on it. And that is so that when you put it into the bowel, which is like a long, soft tube, and you cut, this keeps the open end uh, there. So I often liken it to cutting a sheet of wrapping paper. You know, when you want to go across, you don't want to do lots of little small cuts. You just want to keep going. And this allows you to do that in the bowel because it keeps the lip of the bowel open for you. So that's a, um, a special type of scissor that we use. So if I could open the bowel if I wanted to and wash it all out. Um, OK, so I'm putting the bowel to one side and let's see what else we've got. So we've still got the heart and lungs. And then I've got some of the, the abdominal and pelvic organs. Uh, so I'm going to start to take all of those out. Now, there are different methods of doing this. Some pathologists like to take them out in two blocks, so the, the chest organs and the abdominal organs. Personally, I like them all in one block. And so we take them out of the body and put them onto a marble dissection bench, and then I can dissect them there in more detail and have a, have a good look. So I take my trusty PM40, and you'll remember that we've peeled the skin up to expose the muscles underneath. And then we cut just on the inside of the bone. So if you feel the bone at the bottom of your chin, the cut goes up just inside that all the way around. And then I can reach up and grab hold of the tongue and pull it down. And then as I do that, I can use my knife to cut behind it, to cut all of the connections um, of the organs in the neck. So that will be the trachea, the windpipe, the esophagus, the gullet, <coughs> and then the major blood vessels um, and the muscles and things like the thyroid gland, and they will all come out in one go. And so I'll pull those down and then I'll continue cutting along the back. So I'm really cutting at the front of the vertebral column at the back of the chest cavity. And I can do that and it will bring the lungs and the heart with it. And then I get stuck because I come to the diaphragm and that's the muscle that sits between the chest cavity and the abdominal cavity and it's a, a sort of domed muscle. And so I use my knife to cut round the attachments of the diaphragm to release it. And then I can carry on again and carry on cutting. And it will bring the kidneys, the spleen, the liver, and then down to the bladder. And then I can cut off at the bottom and it will bring all of those out. So I take them all out in one great big lump. Now, before I turn to my dissection desk and dissect those organs, I look back at the body and I get my trusty sponge. This is one of the slightly less specialised items that we use. Um, and I will clean 
the inside of the body to have a look for any abnormalities. So I'm looking in the pleural cavity, I'm looking for things like pleural plaques that might indicate that the person was exposed to asbestos, for example, or I'm looking for tumour deposits. Um, and so I will just clean all of the inside um, so that I can make sure that I'm not missing anything and I can see the spinal column along the back. Um, fine, so that's okay, nothing to see there. So then I would turn to my organs and in some places you have a completely separate table, in others you have a, a table that goes across the legs and so you sit here um, and you can and cut them up. Um, and again, slightly specialised because we're a little bit curved, but a pair of scissors is uh, one of my preferred uh, instruments. Now, interestingly, when you're cutting, both in live people and in dead ones, you really want to avoid just normal cutting. So what we often do is to actually put the scissors in and open them, and it pushes structures apart. And that means that they separate along natural lines of separation. And it means you don't cut important things like blood vessels or the ureter if you're in the pelvis, for example, because it's quite hard once you've cut it to go back and think, did I do that or was that like that beforehand? So we're very careful. So it's called blunt dissection. So it's not destroying anything that's very important. So this is often very useful. But for doing something like opening the trachea, the windpipe, I would just cut it. Um, and uh, I don't think I've got a windpipe to show you. I can show you. So the esophagus, which I, I showed earlier, which has got a bit creased. So this is a long, thin, muscular pipe, and that's where your food uh, goes down from the mouth to the stomach. And you have peristalsis, so the muscle contracts in a certain way to push your food down. So I'll open up the esophagus and have a look. And I'm looking for things like tumours, ulcers. Uh, sometimes I see white deposits, and that might be candida if somebody's got fungal infection in the esophagus. But that's, that's the sort of things I'm looking for there. Then I'll open up into the stomach and I open it along this long border and then I can open it up like a book and have a look. Um, and I'll have a look at the contents. If I'm worried that the gastric contents may be important, then I'll just make a small incision and I will save them into a container. The time they might be important is if somebody may have taken an overdose or may have taken a lot of pills uh, and I particularly want to know what was in the stomach uh, because you can measure the level of drugs in the stomach and then compare it to the level in the blood and it can give you an idea about how much of that drug had been absorbed and perhaps how long ago it was taken. Um, but we don't actually need to do that terribly often. So I'll have a look at the stomach. Again, I'm looking for things like ulcers because ulcers can bleed. So I'd expect the stomach to be full of blood um, and tumours and things like that. Okay. But really, the bit I really want to get to is the heart because the heart and the brain, cardiovascular disease, um, are really the places where we see most of our causes of death. Uh, in people who aren't known to have something else wrong with them, um, heart disease and strokes are really very common. Um, and probably if I could only pick one organ, it would be, it would be the heart. Uh, as you know, we, have, we get a lot of um, coronary heart disease. So uh, I want to look at the heart, and here's a heart. Uh, the average heart weight is about 310 grams. But actually, it depends an awful lot on your size and your level of fitness. So a big 20 stone rugby player would have a, a heart very, very much bigger than a little four foot ten, six stone old lady. Um, and there are tables, thankfully, so we don't have to learn it or remember it. There are tables that tell you roughly the range that you would expect for somebody for their size and age, um, what sort of size their heart should be. So average is about 310 grams. We see a lot of big hearts. Now, there are quite a few things that make hearts big, and probably the most common is high blood pressure. So because the heart has to beat that much stronger, the cells tend to get a bit bigger, um, and it makes the heart bigger. And so, um, it, can, so it can pump the blood around with a, at a higher pressure. And what that does, it puts strain on the heart because those cells can outgrow their blood supply. Um, and so it can cause problems. So people sometimes die from hypertensive heart disease. That's really a, a big heart that's outgrown its blood supply. But the most common cause of death that we find in the heart is ischemic heart disease. So where the main blood vessels that supply the heart have got blocked. And it's a bit like plumbing. It's like having a pipe and it gets more and more furred up with atheroma and fatty deposits that we all know about, which is why we're all meant to have very healthy diets and do lots of exercise to try to reduce those things in our blood. Um, and so the first thing I would do 
when I was examining the heart is to look at the vessels on the surface. So these blood vessels take the oxygenated blood to the muscle of the heart. Now your heart is an amazing muscle. It starts to beat when you're still in your mother's womb and it continues to beat continuously, unless you have an operation that stops it, but until the moment that you die. So it's pretty busy, it's inexhaustible um, and it's an amazing um, organ but it does need a good blood supply to allow it to do that. So it needs a constant energy supply, it gets that from the oxygen and the glucose in the blood. So if you cut off the blood supply to the heart, it doesn't like it. If it cuts it off a bit, you can develop angina. So you start to get pain in your heart um, because it's not getting enough blood. If it cuts it off completely, then you can have a heart attack. And if that's not reversed, the bit of heart that's after the blockage can die completely. Now, it used to be that that was pretty much fatal and sometimes it is sometimes you have a heart attack and it's sudden and it's complete and that's it but increasingly these days if you can catch people early enough and give them to drugs give them drugs to try to dissolve any clots that are in um, the blood vessels then you can get the blood flow going again uh, and get the help them to survive but it's possible that the heart muscle will be permanently damaged so if you've had a heart attack particularly if you've also got hypertensive heart disease, so you've got a big heart already, then that can weaken your heart and it predisposes you to having further heart problems. So all of these things uh, I can look for in the heart. So once I've looked at those vessels and I cut them at about five millimeter intervals using my scalpel, um, because actually the blockage can be quite short. It can only be two or three millimeters. So if I only cut it in a couple of places, I might miss it. So I cut it all the way down and there are three main vessels going down the front and the side and the back. Then I slice the heart, and for that we use something that looks a lot like a bread knife, because it's a bread knife. Um, and um, so we'd slice the heart and have a look at the sections. And the left side of the heart is meant to be bigger than the right, because the right side of the heart is just pumping the blood around the lungs, and the left side is pumping it around the entire rest of the body. So the left side of the heart's always a bit bigger than the right. So we can have a look at those, have a look at the ratios, we can even measure them if we want to. We can have a look at the heart valves and make sure that they're working properly, so they should be opening and closing appropriately as the blood gets pumped around. And we can have a look for evidence of previous damage. Is there any scarring that suggests that somebody might have had a heart attack in the past? Um, is, and uh, so we would have a look at everything we can think of to look at in the heart to see if there are any clues. And often that's where we find our cause of death. Okay, so once I've done that, I'll have a look in the lungs. Now the heart and lungs are very closely related and abnormalities in the heart will often also be manifest in the lungs. So if your heart is failing, it's not pumping blood around, then your lungs may fill up with fluid. Um, so the lungs, we have two of them. They weigh about 500 grams each normally, but if they are full of fluid, so full of water, so normally they're a bit like a sponge. Um, they're normally full of holes, alveoli that uh, where the air comes in and the gas exchange happens, oxygen from the air going into your blood supply to supply your cells and the carbon dioxide that you no longer need going in back into the lungs and gets breathed out because you don't need it. Um, but if they fill up with water, it makes it very difficult to have that gas exchange. So that's why people who have heart failure and whose lungs get, get wet or edematous find it difficult to breathe and why it's easier for them sometimes to breathe sitting up because if they lie down, they get too much fluid um, on their lungs. Also, if you have an infection in the lungs, if you get pneumonia, then that starts to replace the air spaces in the lungs with pus because you have an infection. And again, that's why people who have pneumonia can find it very difficult to breathe. They may get pain in their chest and why it can prove so fatal, particularly to elderly people. So that's why it's so important for the elderly to stay active, to get out of bed. We all hear about ending PJ paralysis and that's not just about getting people up and into their clothes and giving them some dignity and normality. It's about getting them up and moving and breathing normally because if you don't breathe in and out of your lungs, then if you've got an infection in there, it's very difficult to clear it. So I'd have a look at the lungs, slice them open. I'm looking particularly for tumours, which are quite common, but more commonly what I see is the effects of either smoking or living in a, an urban environment and all of our lungs will look slightly grotty, I have to say. So you'll get, we'll all have some black stuff in our lungs. Soot, car exhaust, pollution. If you go to London, you know what it's like when you blow your nose after you've been on the tube. That's what your lungs are like if you're in London. You're breathing all of that stuff in. So 
Um, all of our lungs have got a bit of black stuff in. If you smoke, they'll look much, much worse. Um, and often they'll have holes and cavities where the lung has started to break down. So I only really see nice pink spongy lungs in very young people or people who have not lived anywhere uh, near big cities. OK, so then I'd move on to the abdominal organs. And the biggest one of those is the liver. The liver is always bigger than people expect. The average weight's about 1,500 grams. And this is a fairly normal sized liver. And it sits tucked up underneath your rib cage on the right hand side. And the rib cage is there to try and protect it. Um, it's quite a vascular organ, and if you damage it, you can lose a lot of blood. Um, you can't normally feel a liver unless you're very, very thin, which I am not, um, or unless you've got an enlarged liver, perhaps because it's got a tumour in it and it's started to get big. You can't normally feel it underneath your rib cage, so it's completely protected. So average is about 1,500 grams. The bigger you are, the bigger your liver. I've seen a five kilo liver, which was abs I could hardly lift it, uh, not known for my strength. Um, and that was somebody who had tumour that had started in the bowel and it had spread, metastasized to the liver and it was so full of tumour. It had more tumour than it did liver um, and it was absolutely huge. So the liver can get big. The other thing we look at is the surface of the liver. Now, if you've ever been to the butcher's shop, you can see animal liver. Human liver actually looks a, a bit like that. The surface is sort of shiny and smooth and that's how the liver should be. If you have got cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver, it gets very knobbly and it can start to shrink and it can get yellow. Uh, so an alcoholic's liver could be much smaller and very knobbly um, and that's because of that scarring. Now, once you get scarring, it's irreversible. You can stop it progressing, but you can't reverse it. It's like any scar on your body. It's there to fill or uh, an area that's been damaged um, but scar tissue itself doesn't do very much that, other than sort of plug the gap. It can't function normally. Um, so by the time it gets to that stage, there's not much you can do to reverse the damage to the liver. Um, so we have a look at that. Just behind the liver and behind the stomach is the pancreas. And it's a bit like a little sausage that sits behind um, the, the stomach. It weighs about 100 grams and the main abnormality we see there is pancreatic tumours, so cancer of the pancreas. Um, and so we would always slice the pancreas to have a look. In people with diabetes, which is probably the most common uh, abnormality that we see in the pancreas with type 1 diabetes, we really don't see very much abnormal that's abnormal at all, um, interestingly. So it's really tumours that we're looking for in the pancreas. Then we'll have a look at the um, spleen. So the spleen sits on the opposite side, under the left side of the rib cage, opposite side to the liver, about 170 grams, and it's got a very typical notch in it. You sometimes can feel the spleen, and it's, it's got a notch, so you, can, you, can, you know that's what it is. Um, very, very hemorrhagic organ. This is the one that you really don't want to cut. So if you damage it in a car crash or something, if you, maybe if you fracture a rib and it goes into the spleen, it has a huge blood supply, and you can bleed to death from a damaged spleen very quickly. The good news is you can survive without your spleen. Whereas you can't survive without your heart or your liver or your brain, you can survive without your spleen. A lot of its job is cleaning up the blood and removing bacteria and dead cells. And so as long as you have vaccinations to protect you from some of the infections that the spleen helps to protect you from, then you can live perfectly well without a spleen. But the, the trick is to catch it quickly if your spleen's damaged before you lose too much blood. Then at the back of the abdominal cavity, we have the kidneys. And they sit up sort of at the back there, just under the, the bottom of the, the rib cage. Um, and they're both about 145, 150 grams or so. They are kidney shaped. And uh, they look a bit like the kidneys you see at the butchers. The different thing about uh, human kidneys is they're typically quite smooth. Whereas if you look at lamb's kidneys, they're sort of knobbly, they're knobulated. Uh, but human kidneys are smooth, more like a, a kidney bean. Um, and so I would open the kidney, I'd strip the capsule and have a look. I'd expect a nice smooth surface to the kidney. If it's not, um, I'd be thinking that perhaps they've got some vascular disease. People with very high blood pressure um, get damage to the uh, vessels in the kidney and it can get, look a bit knobbly. So that's another clue uh, that will tell me that perhaps this person had high blood pressure along with the big heart. I'll slice open the kidney, I'm looking for tumours, 
Uh, pus in the kidney system, a lot of elderly people in particular get urinary tract infections and that can go up to the kidneys um, and is not good for you. I look for stones because sometimes you can get kidney stones. Talking of stones, the one organ that I haven't got, oh I didn't, it's because it was hiding behind the gallbladder, I mean behind the liver, it's the gallbladder. And we often see stones in the gallbladder, they're really common. Uh, often they don't cause any trouble, sometimes they do. So in my, the rest of my job as a histopathologist, I spend a lot of time looking at gallbladders that have been removed at operations because people have had pain um, and they often have stones in them. You get some amazing stones in there. Okay, so then I would have a look at the bladder um, and if I needed to collect urine, I would have done it right at the beginning of the post-mortem before I'd cut anything or contaminated anything. Uh, the times that I would really want to collect urine is if I suspect that somebody may have taken some drugs, whether prescribed drugs or illegal drugs. So I would take some urine, I'd take some gastric contents, I'd take some blood, and I would send them all off to toxicology. So although histopathology is one of the different specialties in pathology, but there are about 20 different specialties. Toxicology is one. Microbiology is another. If I suspect that the person has got an infection, and I can't see with my eyes what that infection is going to be, then I might take a swab and send it to microbiology and they might tell me if it's a bacterium or a virus uh, and that can be very helpful, particularly for public health or for tracing other people who might have been in contact with the deceased and to whom they might have passed on an infection. I also might want to do some blood tests and send those to clinical biochemistry. That's another pathology um, department to measure, for example, the glucose uh, in somebody who has diabetes. Now I have to say measuring the glucose in somebody who's dead is not very reliable and that's because the bacteria in our bodies start to use up the glucose as soon as we die because they can't get it from anywhere else um, and so your glucose actually drops really rapidly after you die. So the best place to take glucose that hasn't been attacked by bacteria is in the eye in the eyeball, because that's quite hard for bacteria to get to. They get there last, it's protected. So if we really need to measure a blood glucose, then we take the uh, vitreous humour, or the aqueous humour, out, out of the eyeball uh, and measure it in that. But what we really like is when somebody's come in via the emergency department and had a blood test while they're alive, and then we can phone the lab and say, have you got that blood from somebody? And let's look at that one. Because after death, all sorts of things start happening and stop happening in your body. Now, I do a lot of talks about medical myths and misconceptions, and one of the ones I do, and that the audience very often get wrong, is, does your hair continue to grow just very slightly after your death? And it's am I'm always amazed how many people think that it does, and that maybe your fingernails grow a little bit after your death as well. They don't, they can't, it's not possible. Once you're dead, all the reactions happening in your body stop because you haven't got a blood supply, you're not supplying oxygen and glucose, and so they, they stop straight away. So your hair and your nails cannot grow. However, what does happen after you die is that you start to dehydrate. So you lose water, and because of that, the skin shrinks back a little bit. And on the, on the scalp, it shrinks back, and so the hair hasn't grown, but your scalp has moved. And so it can look, in somebody who was clean shaven before they died, it can look like the hair has grown a millimetre or two. And similarly with the nails, the fingertip skin will shrink back just a little bit. And so the nails will protrude slightly more than they did before. But the nail itself is still exactly the same length. So there, that's a fact that not a lot of people know. <laughs> you can tell everybody all about that. Okay. So once I've examined all my organs, I weigh them and compare them against the normal um, weights that I have in my table or in my head, if I've remembered them. Uh, and there's one important thing that I've forgotten, the brain. Really important to have a look at the brain. Um, as I said, a very common cause of death. Strokes are very common, and uh, so we need to have a look. And I would look at the brain even if I'd found something abnormal in the rest of the organs. The thing about the brain, it's really quite hard to get to. And that's the way we're designed, with a really good, strong skull to protect the brain underneath. Um, so we have to get it out. So I need my scalpel. And so the incision to remove the brain, again done by the APT, um, is from behind one ear, across the back of the skull, to behind the other. So if I show you on me, from here, around the back, to behind the other ear. Now the reason we do it there is firstly it means that we can pull the scalp 
forward and back to expose the bone of the cranium, the skull, here. But more importantly, it means that when we put it back and sew it up, if somebody wants to view the deceased afterwards, they can't see it. If somebody has a good head of hair like this, it's almost impossible to find. But even if somebody is completely bald, because of the position of the incision, once their head is on a pillow, you can't see it. So again, this is how we always remember that somebody may want to see the deceased afterwards. So, having peeled the skin forward and back, it exposes the top of the skull. So, I have a very technical instrument. <laughs> now, I have to admit that these days, most APTs like to use an oscillating uh, mechanical saw, but some don't. Old school um, APTs still like to use this. They feel that it makes less spray. Those oscillating saws, a bit like the ones where you have a plaster cast removed from your arm, so it, it cuts through the hard stuff but doesn't damage the soft stuff underneath. So it cuts through the bone, but it doesn't damage the brain. But it can make an aerosol and put particles into the air that you might then breathe in. Um, also, some people feel they've grown up doing this and they've just got a bit more control. So this is how I learnt um, to remove the top of the skull, although I have to say I haven't done it myself for a long time. Um, so we would use this and we just cut carefully through the bone around about half the circumference of the skull. Now on this one, this is a plastic model, the top of the skull comes off, but they've cut it like the top of an egg. They've just cut it straight. Now in a real person, we don't do that. Um, we get about halfway and then we angle the next incision so it comes about an inch higher at the back and then down. And the reason we do that, I will explain in a minute, don't let me forget to tell you. Once we've, taken, once we've cut through, the top of the skull still doesn't come away because we have lots of membranes that are holding it down and protecting our brain. So I still need something to help me get the top of the skull off. And that's where these come in. This is called a tea chisel because it's T-shaped and it's got a little chisel thin end there. This is called a mallet. <laughs> um, and so the incision that I've made in the bone, I would put the thin end of the chisel in and give it a tap. And then I do that in several places. And this is where I need about three hands. So I put it in the gap tap and then twist and sometimes this is called a skull key because it helps you to open up the skull and it just gives you enough pressure to prise apart and overcome the resistance of the membranes and I might have to do that in a couple of other places all the way around until the top of the skull comes off and we'll come back to this in a minute. So that will reveal the brain and I will look carefully at the brain on the outside of it before I try before I remove it. And I'm looking for things like bleeding. So if somebody's had a hemorrhage <coughs> in the membranes over the brain or they've had a stroke, I might be able to see some blood. And I'm also looking for pus. If someone has meningitis, they might have pus over the top of the brain. But otherwise, the membrane should be clear and I should be able to see the brain tissue underneath. Um, once I've done that, I would carefully pull the brain in different directions and cut all of its connections. So I'd cut the nerves, the nerves to the eyes, to the nose, and eventually get down and cut the top of the spinal column so that I can remove the brain. And then I would roll it carefully out. I'll come back to the skull in a minute. Okay, this brain is too small. It's small because it's uh, a plastic one that's come out of a, a plastic skull. But the, the real thing that's not right about this brain is the consistency, the texture. Now, if you watch Silent Witness, what you'll often find is they'll hold up the brain that's just come out of the body and um, give opinions on what they think is wrong with it. If you did that in real life, the brain would fall around your arm because the brain has a consistency a bit like set yogurt or blancmange or jelly. It's really very soft. It has no muscles or fibres or all those things that make the rest of us uh, protected. The brain doesn't need it. It's got so much bone around it that it's just got uh, nerve cells and fat and it's very soft. So I can pick the brain up like this in my hand and move it over to weigh it. But if I squeezed it, my fingers would go straight through it, like putting my hand into a jelly. 
So the brain is very, very soft. And those ones on television that they managed to hold up must have been pickled for about three months <laughs> um, or be made of plastic. So once I've got my brain and I've had a look at it all, um, then I would slice it using my, my bread knife um, and slice it at about one centimetre intervals and have a look at the different slices and see if there were any abnormalities. In particular, I'm looking for tumours, I'm looking for bleeding. Now, if we thought that the deceased had an unusual uh, neurological condition, or perhaps if they wanted to donate their brain to science, then we would send the brain intact to a neuropathology department. So we don't have one of those here. Our closest one is Adam Brooks. So if we needed somebody to look at the brain in great detail, we would take it out and we put it in a bucket of formalin, which is a fixative that we use to preserve tissue. And we would put a piece of string just around the brain stem and suspend it in the formalin. Now, most tissues um, take a day, maybe two days to fix. So if you have a biopsy, if you have a piece of skin removed and it gets sent to us in the pathology department, it would stay for about a day in formalin uh, before we were able to examine it. The brain can take six weeks and that's because it has so much fat in it. The myelin sheath that covers the nerve cells is so fatty that it makes it very difficult for the formalin to get into it. Um, and so it takes a long time for the brain to become solid enough for the neuropathologist to be able to slice it and then examine it under the microscope. Um, but as a general pathologist, I'm merely looking for really quite obvious things, bleeding um, or tumours. So I said I'd come back to the skull. We would always have a look inside. In particular, I'm looking, I'd strip the membranes off because I want to look for fractures. Perhaps somebody was found at the bottom of the stairs. They may have fallen and fractured their skull. Um, I've identified unexpected assaults in this way. Um, so we always have a look um, to look for any, any damage to the bones. Um, and again, any, any tumours. And the same with the top. And then once I've examined the brain and I've sliced it, there's no way that can go back in the skull because once I've sliced it up, it will be like chopping up a jelly and then trying to put it back in. So all of the organs, once I've finished with them, go into a, a a biodegradable bag that sits in the body cavity and the brain goes in there. So we would clean out the brain uh, cavity, dry it off and then put the skull cap back on. Now you know I mentioned that we don't just cut like this straight across. That's because if you put it on like that it can easily slip. And the last thing you want when somebody views their loved one is for the top of the skull <laughs> to have slipped a bit. So by having an angle, it means that it doesn't slip. Not only that, you'll see that even with this pushed tightly together, you've still got a little ridge where the cut was. And that's also the case if you've cut with a saw through somebody's skull. So we have strips of paper that we put over that ridge before we fold the skin back. And it just flattens it out so that people don't have a ridge on their forehead. So again, just thinking about the appearance of the deceased after they've been reconstructed. So we would do that, pull the skull, uh, pull the skin back and then sew it back up and you wouldn't even know that the brain has been removed. It's not particularly unusual for me to say to the APT, can you do the brain now, please? And they say, oh, we did it half an hour ago um, because you really can't see it uh, once it's been done. So I think we've looked at all of the organs now. And as I've mentioned, the most common cause of death is heart disease. Um, also, we see quite a lot of strokes. People with cancer, which again is a very common cause of death, tend to be seeing their doctors in their run up to death. So we see less of them um, when we do postmortems because it would be unusual for someone with cancer not to have seen a doctor for the last two or three weeks. Um, so we don't see those very often. Um, but we do sometimes find an unexpected one and find that somebody who's been killed in a car crash actually had disseminated cancer all over their body that would probably have killed them in the next couple of weeks anyway. Um, so you do often find things that are unexpected. Now, do we always find a cause of death? No, we don't. We don't, and partly that's because we can't. Some causes of death are not visible with the naked eye. So partly uh, that's why we'll sometimes take small tissue samples to look at under the microscope. So if we see a swelling or a lump, we can't always tell what it is. So we might take a small piece about the size of a postage stamp. And we have these little cassettes, and that's what we would put the tissue in. Then it goes into the fixative, 
and then we would have a look at it under the microscope once the slides have been cut. Um, and any, uh, the tissue would then be saved in our files, our archive files, in the same way that if you have your appendix out, we would keep it. But this is the only tissue we ever keep. We don't keep hearts in jars or any of those things that you might have heard about. Anything that comes out of this individual patient goes back into this patient, albeit not in exactly the same place that it came from because you can't do that. So everything would go back in there. So I mentioned probably the most important part of the post-mortem is the reconstruction. It's putting everything back afterwards. So we've got the organs back in, we've sewn the head back up and can't even tell that's been done. Um, and what else do we need to do here? Well, we've got that rib shield, if you remember, that we put to one side earlier, and that fits straight back in, and it will it sort of slots back into place um, to form the, the rib cage. And then we can pull the pieces of skin up and pull this flap down. And then with a continuous stitch, the APT will sew up this incision and round one side, and then with a second stitch around the other side. The next thing we do, or the next thing the APT does, is to wash the body. And so they would make sure that the person was completely clean, that there was no blood. They'll sometimes use um, shampoo to wash the hair to make sure it's clean. I have to say it's slightly disconcerting when you're working on the next table on your next post-mortem to get wafts of apple blossom <laughs> coming over from the next one because they're having their hair washed. Um, but it's really important to us that we hand the person back to their family in as good a condition as we possibly can. And not infrequently, the family say they looked better after the post-mortem <laughs> than they did before it. Um, and that's really a testament to the great work that the APTs do. I have done post-mortems on people who have gone through windscreens of in car accidents and have had their faces sliced to pieces. And with our trusty super glue, um, APTs can do amazing jobs of putting things together. I've seen them put together the face of an 18-year-old that was previously unrecognisable um, and put, get it into such a state that her mother could come and say goodbye to her. So they really do a very, very important job. Um, and superglue works wonders uh, on, on small cuts particularly. So once the body and everything has been reconstructed, I need to go back to my notes that I put to one side earlier and have a think about well, how I'm going to formulate my cause of death. Now, the cause of death, it has a, there's a standard way of saying the cause of death. We have one A, which is the thing that caused death, due to one B, which is something that contributed to it, and so on. So for example, I might say one A was uh, pneumonia, and one B might be a fractured hip, because somebody broke their hip and then was confined to bed and then developed pneumonia and couldn't get up and about and breathing properly, and so that's what killed them. And so we write the cause of death, and it's not just a list of everything that's wrong with them. We try to explain the process. Now, uh, a normal death certificate has A, B, and C, so you can do up to three things. I've actually gone up to K before, because I've had so many things that I feel have caused a sequence of events. Um, perhaps somebody's had treatment, that's then caused an illness, that then caused them to be immobile, which means that they then develop pneumonia and then they aspirated or there's all these sorts of things. And so we use that cause of death to sort of explain the story in a standardised way. I always also put a commentary, so I'll actually write some text about, I believe this is what happened and this is how it relates to the history that I was given, just to explain my thinking. So it's not just sort of two lines. Now that report goes to the coroner they will normally share it with the general practitioner of the deceased, and they will sometimes share it with the family. The family often don't know what it means, and so they'll often then come back to us to find out, and we try and translate it for them. Um, but in my summary, I try to explain it uh, in a way that I hope the family will understand. But I, I am aware that the, the, the language, as, as all medical language, is sometimes uh, quite difficult for the public to understand. So I will determine my cause of death, I'll write it down, and I'll fax that, straight off to the coroner so that he knows and then he can make a decision about whether he needs to do anything else. He might then want to hold an inquest. Um, about 15% of the deaths referred to the coroner will have an inquest and that's where they actually have a, a jury uh, in some circumstances or they'll just have the family and the coroner in a room and they'll actually go through um, what happened to that person and give a, give a verdict. 
Um, but in, in cases of natural causes where nothing much is suspected, they often don't hold an inquest or they hold one only on paper. So it's not an actual meeting. Um, but the sorts of inquests that you hear about or maybe read in the paper are often where perhaps something's gone wrong and the coroner wants to investigate it in a bit more detail and they'll call different doctors to come along and give evidence. Um, but for most cases, um, that doesn't happen. So I think that's brought us to the end of our autopsy. Now, at this point, I will be able to write a cause of death, often, as I say, ischemic heart disease, because that's so very common. Um, and I will make sure that everybody's got that information. I have a standard pro forma that I then fill out with all the organ weights and the descriptions of all of the organs. Um, they're not always hugely useful at the time, but it's very useful when you come back later. Or if you've done five postmortems in a day, it's very good to have the individual descriptions because otherwise it's very hard to remember one gallbladder from another uh, if you haven't described it properly. So um, I was once told, uh, you're not Jane Austen, you know. You don't <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's just my style, uh, as you can tell. I like talking, I like writing. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of the virtual uh, of our living autopsy. And before I open up the floor to questions, I would like you all to give a round of applause to the real star of the show, our model. <laughs>